بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا وقدوتنا محمد عليه أفضل الصلاة وأزكى التسليم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته um, happy to be a stand-in for the Sheikh Sheikh Mohammed Shanawi uh, this week uh, he asked me on the spur of the moment so we apologize for the short um, runway the short amount of time in which this particular lecture was advertised. Um, but alhamdulillah, everything happens by mashi'atillah, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the timing couldn't be better. A lot of people have been asking me and specifically, and I'm sure you're talking about it over coffee in your homes and in the masjids, about what the Muslim strategy should be when it comes to the elections coming up what should be our attitude and our strategy towards building power locally. Um, it's a huge topic. It's a huge topic and one that because of the events in the aftermath of October 7th, we have been thinking, I think, it's, all, it's as if someone has turned the light on. Uh, that things that maybe we weren't considering before, things are now up for consideration. And I'd like to start today's presentation and the title of this presentation is uh, Islamic political engagement. Um, and it's just something I've been, I've been writing about for the last 10 months. I've actually got 85 pages of unpublished written work that's supposed to come out for Yaqeen's student, inshallah. I think first in sort of segments and then eventually into a book, uh, if Allah wills. But I'm going to share with you just a couple very, very short anecdotes just from this week. In fact, just from the last three days, that demonstrate the need for sophisticated thinking on this front. I received an email just a couple of days ago from a bunch of brothers who are in a place where I'm about to travel in the next few months. And they let me know about a situation where there was a young brother in his 20s that was convicted of material support for terrorism in the mid-2010s, in the mid-2010s, um, he got caught up with uh, some things with Daesh, and he actually gave money to someone who went to go fight. And he came back to the U.S., he himself did not go fight, and now he is serving over 10 years in prison uh, for what he did. Now, the interesting thing about this story is that the prosecutor that he was initially sentenced to, I think, 18 months. And the prosecutor who appealed his ruling multiple times, not just once, was a Muslim. And appealed and appealed and appealed until he got over 10 years in prison. Now I'm just gonna leave that dangling. We're gonna talk about, we're, we're gonna go to another anecdote. Not too far from here, there was someone I know very, very dearly who was involved with fundraising. And some of the more wealthy community members are giving millions of dollars to political action committees on both the Republican and the Democrat side, thinking that they're doing dawah to these organizations, when in reality these organizations are playing them for their money. With absolutely no strategy whatsoever. So I want to give you these almost like three characters. I just threw out three characters. You've got the young, passionate, idealist guy who gets mixed up in something, you know, some sort of like quixotic quest for, you know, swords and steeds and things like that, ends up with over 10 years in prison. You've got the careerist, the person who's got political aspirations, who's uh, an attorney somewhere, who throws the book at this kid in order to sort of advance his career. And then you've got the, you know, uh, your handful of, of rich and wealthy people who have no idea what to do with their money in a way that creates power for the Muslims. Now, this is a perfect cross-section of where we're at and the need for better thinking when it comes to Islamic political engagement. Neither of these three characters are acting strategically or in a principled manner that one could say that this reflects uh, a truly Islamic attitude towards building political power for the ummah. And hopefully, we hope in this very, very short time that we have to talk, we hope that we will go over some things 
maybe this is not exactly what you expect. Maybe you expect me to begin talking about Green Party and this and that and the third. We're going to get there towards the end. But if you don't get the foundation right, okay, you will not really move the needle when it comes to not just this election that's in front of us, but we're talking about the next 10, 20 years of Muslim life in the United States. And I'd like to briefly remind, you know, I'll try to leave as much time as possible for questions. I know people are going to have a lot of questions for this, especially. Um, so if you're able to keep them in mind, and for the sisters, I don't know if one of you has a piece of paper, you can write down uh, questions or collect the questions from the sister's side, and we can make sure that we give you a fair shot as well. The starting point that I would like to begin with, and I think that is essential that we begin with, is to recognize our collective failure. And I say that with complete solemnity and uh, seriousness. That whatever we have done politically as a Muslim community for the last 20 years, the last 30 years, the last 40 years, whatever we did, it was not enough to stop the genocide in Gaza. Whether you take the figure of 40,000, which is the you know, official Gaza health industry, or you take the Lancet figure of 186,000 or more, brothers and sisters, which the Prophet ﷺ told us that their honor is more sacred than the Kaaba, that whatever we did, it didn't stop it. Now, if we lived in Egypt, or if we lived in Bangladesh, or if we lived in other places of the, of the world, we could have maybe an easier excuse. You know, it's not Bangladeshi bullets that are ending up in the skulls of children in Khan Yunus. It's not uh, Egyptian AI that is hacking into WhatsApp and tapping off Israeli intelligence as to the movements of people in Gaza. All of those things come from the land in which you and I live. All of those things, every single bullet, bomb, airplane, ship, tank, cargo vehicle comes from this country that you live in and most of you are citizens in and most of you have a vote in and most of you pay taxes in, right? So is our responsibility more or less than the rest of the Ummah. I think it's more. I think it's much, much more. If the Prophet ﷺ compared the Ummah to one body, the imagery might go like this. That if the heart of the Ummah is Gaza and Palestine, then there is someone stabbing the heart of this Ummah. And we are the right hand. And we are failing to prevent that person with the weapon from stabbing the heart of our body. We have a collective obligation, a very serious collective obligation in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do whatever is possible and principled to stop that hand from stabbing our own heart. Now, what's the folly involved? You know, I always get somebody who asks the question and people start to chuckle and get nervous, but I'm actually really happy when people ask this question. Why don't we just go over, overseas and pick up arms? That's always the question that some young guy asks. And I'm happy that they actually trust me to ask that question. Because I tell them that would be something that would be so easy for the US government to deal with. Because it has the laws on the books to prevent that and to charge you and to throw away the key and to do whatever they want to do with you. It's very easy to deal with that. And of course it's not, we don't believe that it's licit in our religion, Aslan. But even if we imagine for a second that it was, it's probably one of the stupidest things you could do when it comes to actually moving the needle and changing things for your brothers and sisters in Islam, in Gaza, and Palestine. Why? Again, because it all starts here. It all starts here. Again, every gun, every bullet, every bomb, every boat, every ship, every tank, everything starts here. Without even Netanyahu and all of the Israeli politicians have said it explicitly, without the United States, without, it's like uh, on life support, right? It's like a tube, an IV that continuously feeds and continuously feeds. And some of us are dumb enough to be tricked when they, when they start to say we want a ceasefire when they're still feeding the tube. 
and they're still giving $20 billion of weapons this week, and they'll give 20, mil 20 billion more next week, and they'll keep on signing and sending those weapons and telling you that they want a ceasefire and telling you that they want an agreement or, or some sort of exchange, betting that you're going to be dumb enough to believe them. That starts here. So we have to really look in the mirror, and we have to say, what happened? What did we do? What did we fail to do? Whatever strategy it was that we had to build power in this land, to have an influence on the foreign policy of our own nation, the United States of America, we have to admit that it categorically and catastrophically failed. And why do I start with this? Because there's some people that are still holding out. There's some people that say, no, 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 we just keep on building the relationships. We just keep on, you know, I call this biryani diplomacy, by the way, which biryani diplomacy is very nice for Dawa, but we're not talking about Dawa. We're talking about politics. And Siasa is an entirely different thing than Dawa. And so the idea that we will be able to ingratiate ourselves and be likable enough and be charming enough and develop friendships and let these people basically become our friends so that then they'll protect us or not kill us, that that has been proven completely false. Every single relationship that we had, every single inroad that we thought that we were making has run dry. It has come up completely useless. It has not been able to be leveraged for anything, zero. So I'm insistent on this. And if people disagree, we can disagree and we can talk about it in the time for questions. But we can't move on unless we accept our past failure and come up with an entirely new strategy. That when 9-11 happened, and this was a pre-social media world, and this was a very scary time, and basically the Zionists for decades had been building out laws to criminalize resistance in Palestine and also to criminalize Islam here uh, at home, there was sort of a, a challenge, and we kind of ducked that challenge. And there were reasons for that, and we're not necessarily blaming. We turned into relief work. We turned to things that were safe. Schools were getting shut down. People were getting shipped back abroad and deported. Lots of things were happening. It was a very scary time, completely understandable. But we also have to reckon with the fact that that response also kicked the can down the road to today. That the issues that we did not rise to meet in the time after 9-11 have now come back around. Maybe, you could argue, more difficult, maybe a little bit less difficult. There's some things for us and some things against us. But my point in bringing that up is that they will continue to come back around until we actually solve them. They're not going anywhere. The Zionists aren't going to rest. Evil will not rest, and we'll talk about that in a second. They will continue trying to criminalize Islam until you can't say la ilaha illallah, but they'll call you a terrorist. And there's some interesting history with that, with the legislation, but that's not for our topic tonight. So we have established a couple things. First of all, our collective duty, our unique collective duty. We are uniquely responsible as Muslims in the United States of America, to help the Palestinians and to help especially the people of Gaza. And that everything that we've been doing up until now has failed. And we need to come up with a new strategy and we need to reanalyze the problem even. Sometimes the problem with your strategy is a result of the way that you understand the problem, right? If I'm sure, how many doctors we have in here? Probably a lot, right? Raise your hand if you're working in the medical field in some capacity, mashallah, okay? So if you have a misdiagnosis, right? Somebody misdiagnoses or something. They come in with a cough. You say it's COVID. It's not, it's something else. For those of you who believe in COVID. Well, we all believe in COVID, right? There's no holdouts. 2024, guys, I mean, we can. You say it's COVID, it's something else. It's walking pneumonia or whatever. Your prescription for that thing is going to be completely different. And so sometimes you have to go back to your diagnosis. What is it actually that we're trying to solve? 
What is it that we're trying to overcome? What's the anatomy of it? What's the nature of the problem? If we misunderstand the problem, then our solutions will also fall short. Which is why I have a bold proposition. I believe that only Islam can truly save Palestine. I believe that only Islam can truly sa save Palestine. And that's something of a slogan. And that's difficult because now we have to get past the level of slogans. What I mean by this is that I went to these big marches that were held in Washington, D.C. I'm sure many of you did as well. I think there was one in November. There was another one maybe January, February, sometime in the winter. Then there was another one that happened more recently. And I remember, I think someone from the Palestinian Feminist Collective, that group, was on stage and had the mic. And, you know, these things are put together mostly by secularists, mostly by Answer Coalition and these types of groups. And, you know, she was screaming at the top of her lungs, we want a secular Palestinian state. And I thought, like, oh, that's kind of interesting to say. Like, I wonder, I wonder if there are other people here that, that disagree with that. I wonder what the role of Islam is in, a, in the future of Palestine. It was just a thought. And then later, I had an interview with uh, Dr. Enes Tikriti from the UK. And you can look this up on Yaqeen Institute. He was on our, our program. And he made this point. He said, you know, we have to be careful because sometimes the language that we're fed from outside our own communities doesn't reflect our values and it leads to other problems because and he said and he was pretty he was fairly provocative he said what good has we don't just want a state in Palestine he said what good has a state done in Egypt what good has a state done Jordan what good has a state done the Emirates and he had a point he had a point that if we don't take care to build something that is going to be resistant to different types of hegemony, different types of power, different types of encroachment and destabilization, then we'll get the same situation in Palestine that we have in Egypt. We'll get a corrupt dictator ruling over it that's subservient to Western interests, selling out the people on the ground, squashing Islam, all these sorts of things. That being said, we have to keep in mind, we have to keep divine guidance front and center, which is the entire point of this writing and this lecture, that divine guidance has to be front and center. It's not simply an issue of social justice, right? Social justice is a term that many people in the activist space use. It conveniently makes the divine optional. Society is not something that necessarily has to have a God involved. Nor are these things simply an issue of settler colonialism, another sort of you know, frame and lens through which to look at this. Of course, there are dimensions that that's true, but there's more than that that's going on, especially for a committed Muslim. That at the bottom of this thing, at the bottom, the issue, the problem, is sharr, is evil. And that this is one of the greatest manifestations of evil in our time. We can also say munkar. These types of descriptions and these types of, of concepts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to us. That exist in our own tradition. That weren't handed to us by some sort of political theorist or some social theorist or somebody who doesn't have our values, doesn't share our motivations. Now... Why is this significant? What's the difference between someone who looks at this issue and says, no, this is an issue of human rights, right? Versus, actually, this is an issue of good versus evil. There's a lot of consequences to that difference. The person who looks at it at just that this is an issue of human rights, and we're not saying it's not about human rights, that has a dimension to it, but it's not exclusively about human rights. Because many people can't even agree on who a human being is or who gets to count as a human being. Look at all of the institutions we have across the world that are supposed to be the enforcers of these human rights. What have they done for Palestine? Are Palestinians considered human within the ecosystem of the international legal order? Are Muslims, is the turbaned bearded Muslim man considered a full human according to these ways of looking at the world? Or 
are they the ones who are the first ones to go? This is like a, a horror movie. You know, they say the black guy is always the first guy to get killed. That's how it happens in Hollywood, right? Within these discourses, the bearded, turbaned Arab man is the first one to be bombed, to be droned. So how far can human rights get us? How far can this discourse get us? If it doesn't address the difference in what we think is a human being and what other people think is a human being. Other people don't recognize divine rights. Other people don't recognize that Palestine is a waqf, was made a waqf by Umar ibn al-Khattab and that it's impermissible to sell it. It's impermissible to give it up. It's impermissible to normalize and to allow the Zionists to take it over. And how we make sense of this problem is very, very important. And that's not to say again that this is an exclusively Islamic issue. There are people who are human rights activists. Ahlan wa sahlan. You're welcome. You can come and join and we'll all try to do what we can for Palestine together. But the problem is, the problem is that as many people who are active in the activist space are well aware that many people are so scared of the post 9-11 war on terror sort of situation and climate that they're very uncomfortable allowing it to also have an Islamic dimension. They're very uncomfortable with people coming to a protest and saying la ilaha illallah or saying Allahu Akbar. They're very uncomfortable with Muslims who are clearly practicing Muslims praying at a protest. And alhamdulillah, here locally we don't see that. Alhamdulillah, we've, I think it's better here in the Lehigh Valley than in many, many other places across the nation. But in many other places across the nation, there is a push to silence this part of the movement to help Palestine. That's right, the values that are shared by the overwhelming majority of Palestinians, not all of them, but the overwhelming majority of Palestinians are often silenced and suffocated here in the place where we attempt to uh, do what we can. So we have to keep Islam front and center. If you and I are going to do what we can, we have to be acting from our Islam and through our Islam. That human rights have failed, let's be honest. The UN is a joke, let's be honest. The entire international liberal order that existed after World War II has also failed. And so what do we have to lose by looking at this through a more Islamic lens? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us to struggle. And yes, the word for struggle is jihad. And no, jihad is not limited to military actions. If you go into any book of fiqh, the definition of jihad is i'zaz ad din as giving honor to the religion. And giving honor to the religion is something that there's many, many ways to do it. Giving the adhan in public is i'zaz ad din Right? Representing in a principled way your faith is i'zaz ad din This is something that we shouldn't shy away from. Even though we know that there are people who want to criminalize this word, that again, if we allow them to, then they will soon be criminalizing even more basic things to our faith than that. If we look at it through an Islamic lens, then we have to head back to our sources with a different type of lens, a different type of eye. What are we looking for? We're looking through the Quran, we're looking through the seerah, we're looking through the sunnah of the Prophet with different eyes. What does the Quran have to say about politics? What does the Prophet have to teach us about politics? What does the seerah of the Prophet have to teach us about politics. A lot. A huge amount. And unfortunately, this is something we are very, very weak in and undeveloped in. Where are the books that explain the siyasi dimension or the political dimension of the seerah? In English, no less. They're very, very few and far between. So we have a lot of work to do. One of the things that we find when we return to our sources and we look at these sorts of things, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemns weakness from our ummah. Weakness is not a praiseworthy character whatsoever. Allah azza wa jal condemns weakness, both implicitly and explicitly. Implicitly in the story of Lut, when Lut alayhi salam is confronting sort of his people and his people are busting down the door to try to get at the angels who are disguised as his guests. What does he say? He says, if only I had against you some sort of power or could take refuge in a strong support. 
Meaning that if Lut had access to power, he would have used his power to stop the munkar, to stop the sharr, to stop the evil that was going on. That this weakness is not a good thing. We also have an ayah in Surah Al Imran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blames people who claim that they cannot leave an oppressive situation, but in reality they can. It's almost a counterintuitive ayah to read because normally, especially in our modern sort of lens, we're used to immediately sympathizing with the oppressed, and that's good. But in this particular ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the angels basically called them out and said, no, you had the opportunity, you had the ability, and you failed to use your ability, and so actually you are, you are blameworthy. Indeed, this is the English translation, indeed, those whom the angels take in death while wronging themselves, the angels will say, in what condition were you? We, they will say, we were oppressed in the land. The angels will say, was not the earth of Allah spacious enough for you to emigrate therein? For those that refuge is hell, and evil it is as a destination. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also explicitly condemns weakness when he says, do not weaken and do not grieve while you are superior if you are true believers. And he also says, do not weaken in the pursuit of the enemy. So we see that weakness, this idea that we're just to be absolutely meek and you know, if we're just able to completely roll over and play dead, that we'll be safe, is not something that we find in the Quran is not something that we find in Islam. Now the corollary of this is that if weakness is blameworthy, then power is an obligation. Building power for your community is actually an Islamic obligation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَعِدُّ لَهُمْ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ قُوَّةِ Prepare for them, the enemies of Islam, the people that want to see you dead. And Allah has shown us many of them in the last 10 months. Prepare for them what you can of power. And he leaves power, nakira. He leaves it undisclosed. He gives some examples after it, but they're not exhaustive. Anything that gives power to the Muslims in order to establish a type of deterrence to stop Muslims from being harmed is something that is necessary for us to do. That could be electoral. That could be financial. That could be organizational, that could be institutional. There's many, many, many things, especially in the United States of America where we have many freedoms that we don't have in other places. The avenues that are open to us to actually build collective power are much more numerous than what you would find in many places in the Muslim world where you even have this conversation and we're all going to jail, right? So what type of blame is it on us that if the average person in Jordan or the average person in the West Bank or the average person in Egypt, what would they do for the freedoms that you and I have? The abilities to affect things that you and I have. And here we are not using them or not using them intelligently. Aib. This is a shame and it's something that we have to fix. The Prophet wasallam told us that there will come a day where this weakness would overtake us and that the weakness is rooted in a spiritual malfunction or a spiritual disease or a spiritual shortcoming. He said, alayhi salatu wasalam, the people will soon summon one another to attack you as people when in eating, invite others to share in a dish. Somebody present asked, will that be because we're few at that time? He said, alayhi salatu wasalam, no, you will be numerous at that time but you will be as scum and rubbish like that carried down by the, by the waves or by the torrent, like the, the stuff on top of the water. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take fear of you from the hearts of your enemy and will put in your hearts fear of your enemies. Somebody asked, what is this wahn? Like, what is the thing that is afflicting us? The Prophet ﷺ called it wahan, and the companion asked, what is it? And the Prophet ﷺ replied, love of this world and dislike of death. That, the long and short of it, is that we're not prepared to sacrifice. We're too attached to the dunya. We're too afraid to do what needs to be done 
pooling our money, pooling our talents, pooling our, our resources to actually build something that is a counterweight that might affect the foreign policy of the land in which we live. What's stopping us other than ourselves? What have we seen the last 10 months? Are the Zionists more numerous than the Muslims? Not really. Many people, they say, APAC has so much money, we'll never be able to raise that much money. I guarantee you we have that much money in the Muslim community, first of all. But even if it weren't true, doesn't it take much more money to prop up falsehood than it does to establish the truth? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes to the Quran, and I s definitely recommend people to review chapters such as Surah Al-Anfal and Surah Al-Ma'idah and Surah Al-Tawbah. And you'll find time and time again in these verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the battles. One of the most dangerous things to the Muslims is the fear and the hypocrisy that's in the hearts of the Muslims themselves. He doesn't talk about the fe fearing the enemy. He doesn't talk, and the Muslims were going up against forces that were three times bigger than them, five times bigger than them, ten times bigger than them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't really talk much about that. He talks about the fear and the cowardice and the attachment to the dunya that's in the heart of the Muslims. In fact, he says, so you see those in whose hearts is disease hastening to associate with those who deny. And their justification for doing this is saying, we're afraid that a misfortune may strike us. So basically you have a situation where there are Muslims that are throwing in their lots. Imagine they're working for the Department of Defense. Imagine they're working for the State Department. Imagine that they're working for Lockheed Martin. Imagine they're having these relationships and they're working on this dawa. And what's their justification? They say, we're afraid that a misfortune may strike us. We're afraid that if we don't play the game, we're going to be criminalized, we're going to do this. Allah says, but perhaps Allah will bring conquest or a decision from Him. And they will become, over what they did, regretful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us time and time again that we are to fear none above Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so as much as we might fear, yes, a Trump presidency, or yes, sort of, you know, the derailing of democracy, or yes, being criminalized, or yes, being accused of being terrorist. I was just accused of being a terrorist last week. This guy that was on Fox News, Ryan Morrow, wrote a, a hit piece against me and Omar Suleiman, saying that we're terrorist supporters. Do I, do I have dreams at night in which I'm being tortured? Yes, I do. Is there fear? Yes, there is. But my fear for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater. My fear that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would reject me at the hawd because I failed to help my brothers and sisters in Palestine. That I would get to him alayhi salatu wasalam, and I lived in comfort, and I lived in opportunity, and I had freedoms, and I had chances, and I didn't take them. Because I was, I was afraid. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam, would turn me away and say, I have nothing to do with you. I fear that more, and you should fear that more than whatever they can do to you in this dunya. Fear is worship of the heart, and nothing should be feared more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we are failing in a collective obligation, fard kifaya, which is protecting our brothers and sisters and building this type of power so that we might protect our brothers and sisters, then all of us are responsible. So building power is a must, it's not a luxury. It's something that absolutely has to happen. That we will not be able to do anything or move the needle or change anything in this country if we are not able to build some type of power. I'm trying to skip over things to get to, I know you guys are wanting to know the juicy parts about the election and stuff like this. But power is built like a pyramid. One of the mistakes that the Muslim community has made has two parts to it. One is to get tricked by identity politics. They will always find one of us to trick one of us. Always. This is always the way. Even in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us a story of Qarun. You know who Qarun was? Ibn Ammi Musa, alayhi salam. Ibn Kathir, rahim Allah, he says that Qarun was the first cousin of Musa, alayhi salam. And that Fir'aun specifically used Qarun, gave him all this money, bought him, Qarun's a collaborator, 
right? He's the colonial enforcer. He's the overseer. He's the, the supervisor in order to keep Bani Israel down. When the whip cracks, Qarun's on the other side of it, not Fir'aun. Fir'aun keeps his hands clean. It's Qarun is the one who holds the whip. Isn't that how it happens with us? Yes, that is how it happens with us as well. They will find the Muslim Zionist over here. They will find the Muslim who has ambition over here. The Muslim who's a, attracted to the dunya or addicted to the dunya over here. They will pay them a handsome salary. They will give them a speaking tour. They will give them a book you know, to write. They will take a, care of everything. And our response has to be more strategic and more principled than that. Because if we take one person and throw them up, let's say, to the federal level, what are we thinking that that person is accountable to? Let's imagine we take someone here. I take Abdullah, Pennsylvania's finest. Abdullah is going to be our representative. We found we have enough population in this district. We're going to all get, you know, get out the vote. We're going to get Abdullah up to the federal level, mashallah. Here comes the Democratic Party. I said, well, you're going to need money for your campaign, Abdullah. This Muslim community of yours, how much are they going to pay you? Oh, maybe we scrape together. We're giving our money all in relief. Right? All relief. Muslims give their money to relief, which is alhamdulillah mamduh. Alhamdulillah, that's not bad. But we're not stopping what causes the, the need for relief in the first place. When your own country, when we're talking about not outside of natural disasters here, outside of natural disasters, our country's foreign policy creates the need for relief. And we think we're just going to give money in relief. So the Democratic Party comes to Abdullah and says, you know, your community is giving all this money to relief, but I see they haven't really given much to you. Your you know, average congressional campaign probably costs between $60,000 and $100,000. Here's $100,000. Who do you think he's accountable to? Is he accountable to us? No. He's accountable to the Democratic Party. He has to dance by their tune. And he will. If we don't have an entire pyramid beneath Abdullah, that we both support him. He doesn't need support from anyone else. And he's also accountable to us. You see how that works? That we have to make sure that we build... So the first thing that we've done is we've fallen prey to identity politics. They always... How many people were celebrating Obama? Admit it. Back in 2008. Admit it. It's a safe space. Yeah. Cheer. Where? Hussein. Hussein. I was in Turkey. I was in Turkey when Obama was elected. Every single Turk on the street said, Hussein. Wink, wink. Obama Muslim. Obama Muslim. Wink, wink. Everybody was saying that in Turkey. And then he had his speech that he gave in Egypt. He gave a lot of lip service. To the we, thought, we thought it was Fat Mubin. And then he started CVE. And then he started droning. And he was responsible for countless deaths of Muslims across the Ummah. And even assassinated American citizens abroad. So we're tricked very easily by identity politics. We have to look at principles and we have to look at values more than we look at identity. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that we need to be, build power up as a base, as a pyramid. You have to start locally. You know, subhanAllah, when I was up in Utica, the city council, our district, all you needed was 200 votes to put someone on the city council. Very easy for a masjid to do. Even figuring out the number, what's the district, what's the ward, how many votes, what were the history of the last three elections, how much does it take, how much is it going to take. It's very easy stuff. School boards. Nobody wanted to be on school boards until LGBTQ came along. Then people started paying attention. Usually, if you hang around long enough and you know enough people, these are easy positions to get into. How many opportunities like this have we had that we haven't taken advantage of? And then we wonder why we have no say. We wonder why we have to run to this person, the next person, begging them to not hurt us or to not force our kids to learn X, Y, or Z, or etc. But we haven't put in the work, and we haven't built power slowly from the ground up. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change what is in themselves. A very well-known ayah, often misinterpreted and misapplied. Because it also has to be paired with what the Prophet sallallahu said when he said, whoever among you sees an evil, then let him change it with his hand. And if he cannot, then with his tongue. And if he cannot, then with his heart. And even that, that's the weakest of faith. 
So the change is not just, yes, you have to pray on time. Yes, of course, nobody disputes this. But you also have to take the opportunities for change, the asbab that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. If you know that the United States of America operates on being organized and being able to get a lot of people to do the same thing at the same time and be able to organize your money and apply it in very strategic ways, then this is one of the asbab that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. This is one of the means that he created for you to take care of your community and even save people abroad. So then you have to, you can't expect a different result if you did not change what you're doing. We're running up in time. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be brief and, and cut to the chase tonight, especially we're going to have a lot of questions, I know. When we look at all of the different types, okay, I'll talk about allyship and coalition building, though I'll talk about it only just a little bit because I have an article out on that in Yaqeen Institute called, you know, um, I think it's called Gaza and Intersectionality or something like that. One of, another one of our mistakes, in addition to being tricked by identity politics, somebody that looks like us, has our name, etc. And thinking that we can just throw someone to the top level before building a power base beneath them is also an over-reliance on allies. And what I mean by this is that often our, what we have to offer as Muslims and our perspective, our Islamic perspective, gets completely lost and completely swallowed and completely erased when we step into these quote-unquote alliances. Many of these so-called allies only like you if you leave part of your deen behind. And that's just true. Many of them are not really comfortable with a believing Muslim. They want the cute Muslim, Islam cute. They want the, the, the watered-down Islam. They want the progressive Islam. They're filled with anxieties about you, what you really believe. What do you really say about us when you're in your masjids? And up until this point, we have only had a relationship of being essentially uncritical of these people who are supposedly here to help us. To the point that it doesn't seem like we're respected very much. And it doesn't seem like we're allowed to negotiate anything within this relationship. So we will keep quiet when there is, just as an example, a protest and out come the rainbow flags. And then many people from the Meshi don't want to go. Why would I bring, I wouldn't bring my kids to a, to a protest when Queers for Palestine is in the front row. Correct? I don't know about you, I wouldn't. But then there's other people, that, oh, they're our allies, they do so much for us, they're always... What are they really doing for us? Is the genocide over? Or is the genocide still going on? We have to have metrics and criteria by which we are able to judge what's actually getting accomplished here. We can turn out 100,000, 200,000, 500,000 people in Washington, D.C., and at the end of the day, we really just made a bunch of noise and told and vented. Did we really achieve any objectives? And even if people are coming from a good place that have very different values from us and we appreciate their solidarity, are they helping us achieve our, achieve our goals? Do we have the same goals? Or are they even holding us back from potentially doing things in a different way that would get our goals achieved? when anybody who's a conservative looks at any pro-Palestinian rally and they say, oh, this is Antifa. Oh, this is just the left. Oh, these are all the neo-Marxists. Allowing our movement to be so easily categorized in this culture war, is that helping our cause? Or is that potentially holding it back? These are things that we really have to think about. And I'll, I think I'll just wrap it up real quick and then we'll get to questions because I know people are going to want to talk about things. The biggest threat, the biggest threat that we have to achieving our goals, to building power and to actually achieving change 
are the unprincipled people in our midst. The people who either, there are some people with, without good intentions. There are other people that have good intentions, but they're just not strategic enough. I'll give you two examples, okay? Example number one was a certain Pennsylvania-based Muslim group who the second Kamala Harris became the assum assumed nominee before she named her vice president, came out and endorsed her. Okay? This is an example of political illiteracy. Why? Because politics works by having something that this other person wants. And you hold on to that thing to try to extract as much as you can out of the other person and then exchange it for something real. You don't give it up and then hope to get something else in the future, right? That's essentially bad politics. And that's what was going on here. Logic number one, school of thought number one, if we support them first, they'll see how much indebted to, to us they are and then they'll come around and they'll do something for us later. Never happened. It's never happened. It doesn't happen that way. Example number two was the abandoned Biden campaign. The abandoned Biden campaign said, we are going to make you lose, Democratic Party, no matter what. Okay, things were stirring for a while. Biden has his first debate, tanks it. All of a sudden, Biden's gone. Okay. The Democratic Party does not want an open convention, so they maneuver and they play all their dirty tricks. I'm in a lot of WhatsApp groups with, with delegates. They play every dirty trick in the book to make sure it's a no contest for Harris. Abandoned Biden says, okay, now we're abandoned Harris. Harris has two choices between Walls and between Shapiro. Shapiro's probably a bit worse, though neither, neither of them are good, but Shapiro's probably a bit worse. The abandoned Biden campaign continues to hold on to its leverage. Harris goes with Walls, hoping that the Muslims will be stupid enough to think that he's actually pro-Palestinian. Okay? We continue to hold on to our leverage. We're still critiquing her. We're still protesting her at the Democratic National Convention, still going on right now. Now, she has to start to pay lip service. She's saying, well, we want a ceasefire even though she's still sending money and she's trying to play both sides. What I'm saying is that when you hold on to your leverage, you can keep someone moving. You keep someone on the defense. You keep pushing them and pushing them and pushing them. Some people within the abandoned Biden campaign, they wanted to endorse Jill Stein in May. I told them, no, don't do it. Hold on as long as possible. And then a secret between you and me Jill Stein came to Abandon Biden earlier this month and told Abandon Biden, you can name our vice president. No strings attached. You can decide who our vice president is. Someday I'll tell you that story in full and how we dropped the ball on that. But see what holding on to your leverage can do. When you hold on to your leverage, anybody listen, the way I give it the example, everybody here, we have connections with, with back home in some way, shape, or form. If you go to the souk, if you go to the marketplace, you don't start haggling until you walk away from the table. If you're not willing to walk away from the table, you're not really haggling. He's going to dictate his price. He's got you. This is politics, okay? And until we get this in our heads, we will never, ever, ever start to build power. And what's crazy is this is actually how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam conducted politics himself. Things that you probably never heard of, or if you've heard of them before, you never heard, thought of them in that way. Do you know what the Battle of Badr? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we know of the story about when they, uh, they reached the wells of Badr and you know, the whole thing around that. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did something very interesting. He took one of the companions and they walked away from the camp. And they walked out of eyesight from the camp. And they ran into a Bedouin. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he wanted to gather intelligence as to where the enemy army was. And so he asked the Bedouin, he said, hey, we heard that the, uh, the Muslim army is in the area. Is that true? Where are they at? He's acting as if he's not part of them. The Prophet said, Al-Harb Khuda'ah. 
that war is deception. And so he's making it seem like he's not part of the Muslim army. Why? Because he wants to test this guy. Is he going to tell him the truth or not? The Bedouin says, yeah, yeah, they just came up and they're camped here and it's only so far away. And it was exactly correct. It was exactly the correct location of the army. So then the Prophet ﷺ asked him, where's the army of the Quraysh? And now he can trust the answer because he tested him. The savvy of the Prophet ﷺ, the political savvy, is absolutely off the charts. How he conducted himself at the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, making the Quraysh people misinterpret the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, maybe worse than anything in the Sirah. They imagine that the Treaty of Hudaybiyah is about compromise. It's not at all about compromise. The Treaty of Hudaybiyah is about making your enemy think that they're getting something. When in reality, you're getting everything. Every single shart, every single condition and stipulation of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah benefited the Muslims. Every single one. But on the outside, it seemed to be the opposite. Right? One of the conditions, okay, 10 years, no fighting. Anybody can enter into any alliance that they want. If someone in Medina apostates and wants to join the Quraysh, he's allowed to go. If someone in Medina, excuse me, in Mecca, converts to Islam, he's not allowed to join the, up in Medina. Does this benefit the Muslims or not? It benefits the Muslims. Why would you want an enemy within your own territory? Get them out of there. And won't you want someone behind enemy lines when it's time to liberate Mecca? Of course you would. The Quraysh thought they were getting away with something. It was all in the benefit of the Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ was extremely savvy politically. He knew exactly what he was doing after Uhud. The Muslims, some scholars say we lost Uhud. Some say it was a draw or something like that. Anyway, it was very dangerous. The Quraysh start to retreat in the desert. Okay? What was the first thing the Prophet ﷺ did? He gathered everybody and he said, let's go pursue them. They're wounded. They're dying. They're weak. But he did it because he wanted to give them the perception that he had backup. Afraid that they would change their minds, come back to Medina and finish the job. And that's exactly what happened. The Quraysh stopped halfway. They said, wait a second, where are we going? Why are we running away? We can go back to Medina and finish these guys. And then their scouts said, uh-oh, Muhammad's coming with reinforcements. Let's get out of here. And they ran back to Mecca. All of it was a bluff. The Prophet ﷺ understood how politics works. People are not your friends. This is the biggest lesson that Muslims have to learn. People are not your friends. <inaudible> your only friends in this dunya are Allah and the Messenger ﷺ and the people of faith. That's it. And we do da'wah to other people. We smile. We give them khidmah. We give them service. We give them our, that's the time for biryani diplomacy when you're doing da'wah, bring them into the masjid, give them some food, you know, make them see the beauty of Islam. But when it comes to politics, you have to understand that no one is your friend. And that it's just about power responding to power. And the actions of the Prophet ﷺ demonstrate that he understood that perfectly well. So what should the Muslims do in November? ICPA is a 501c3. I cannot tell you who to vote for, who not to vote for. However, I will say this, that the Muslim community in 2024 is voting for 2028. The Muslim community in 2024 is really voting for 2028. If there were a situation in which somebody, let's, let's give this example. Imagine you have ma'adallah, an abusive spouse. And that can go either way, by the way. There are spouses that the husband is abusive, there are, there are marriages where the, the wife is abusive. Imagine an abusive spouse. Physical violence, manipulation, gaslighting, all these horrible things. When do they start actually listening to you? If you say, you know, no matter what you do, I'm going to run back to you. Or I'm really afraid of another relationship more than you, so I guess you're, you're better than some other people out there. 
Or, you know, I'm starting to reconsider. I'm not quite committed. Uncommitted, you could say. How does that work? That doesn't do anything. The person knows that they have you. They know that you will, push comes to shove, you will come running back time and time again. The only way to deal with an abusive spouse is to wait till they leave or kick them out and change the locks. And then they take you seriously. And politics is all about being taken seriously. Uh, okay, there's so much more to talk about, but I know that there's probably some burning questions. So maybe we should, we should have some time for questions. Do we have a floating mic? I don't know if the sisters were able to write down anything. Abdullah, Bismillah.